Um, welcome to Fresh from the Farm, right, on Saturday morning. And it's your friend, Lisa Mason Ziegler. And friends, it is blowing a gale outside. So if for some reason we get cut off here, it's because we've lost plower, power. I mean, it is literally blowing an enormous wind out there. So today I'm really excited for us to um, kind of, I'm going to go through my sunflower early bird strategy. Again, I'm going to sow some sunflower seeds, as well as we're going to start another tray of salvia cuttings. I'm going to, I've taken the cuttings and we're going to set them up to root. And I did um, just want to say to everybody, remember this, we are pushing the envelope with the early bird sunflowers, um, because we feel like here on our farm that having sunflowers just one week earlier or one more week earlier or even one week earlier than that is nothing but beneficial. But there are some steps you have to take. And then you have to know that we're taking a gamble here, right? So I have a different setup here today. I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm actually streaming on a streaming service. And I'm actually streaming to a couple of different places and I'm on a laptop. So I have to get myself kind of set up here. Um, I think we should sow sunflowers first. Um, and I do want to show you the tray. Let's see. So today is, I'm not even sure what is today. Today's March 12th. So I actually started my first sunflowers um, a little bit more than a week ago. I'm actually a couple of days late for scheduling issues, but I'm going to show you the tray that I actually started on March 3rd and tell you why um, it, it has a couple little issues going on. But I wanted to share it with you because y'all know, right, that I am totally all about sharing the good, the bad, and the ugly. So we only, you know, the other thing I want to just say about this early bird business, you don't go all in. You don't start, you know, you don't break the bank starting 3,000 sunflower seeds on a gamble, right? So here is the tray that we started. I want you to notice, see how these ones, um, this tray is going to bend. Er, sorry, y'all. Logistics trying to get my arm underneath. All right. So see here that this y'all, and again, there we go. This end um, is not quite exactly like this little spot. You can see that there's different varieties of colors started here. And look down here. That is the white light. Notice how it's even slower and it's also a little bit shorter naturally. And so I just wanted to say that Growing multiple varieties of, these are all pro cuts except for the sun fill, which I'm not sure which one the sun fills are. Oh, they're right, dead in the middle, um, are all pro cuts except for the sun fill and how they have varying habits. Um, and so I just wanted to show you this. These guys were popped on to the heat mat right after we started them together, um, sat there for probably about three to four days until they really got sprouted. Then I moved them over to grow lights. Um, so let's just cover a little bit of this early bird strategy, right? Um, so if you're a flower farmer, having sunflowers for Mother's Day, if you live in uh, you know, a region that you're able to do that, could make a huge difference in your bottom line. So it's definitely worth experimenting. So through my experimenting the last couple of years, um, I have learned that Sunflowers are certainly not cool season hardy annuals, but they're cooler, cold, to cool tolerant. That's a good word to use. And so that led me to start starting them earlier and earlier because they are a significant cash crop on our farm for all these years. Um, and let me just say, if I could have Mother's Day sunflowers, that would be a huge coup. And that's exactly what we did last year. So I am going to um, get myself set up here to actually do the sunflowers. And let me see how I am going to aim. This ought to work out okay. So I've got my plug trays. Um, experiment number one, you might notice that this mix looks just a smidgen different um, than the mix that I normally use. We happen to find ourselves with a lot of cocoa fiber, um, a lot. And 
So Bobo mixed the cocoa fiber along with a little bit of the normal just potting seed starting mix that we use often um, together with compost. It's like an equal amount of cocoa fiber and potting mix. Those two were mixed. Um, and then she mixed 50% compost in here. My normal mix for starting sunflowers is 50% of any kind of potting soil. It does not need to be seed starting soil. It does not need to be blocking mix for those of you that are soil blockers. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out. So this is the end that you guys can see. Y'all, you just don't even know how <laughs> this is kind of a fun little challenge for me. I'm dyslexic and the camera is swapped. Um, so this is really going to be a lot of fun. So that's what the mix normally is, is 50% of any potting mix um, and 50% Finished compost, key word there, y'all, finished. That means it's totally cooked. We literally buy it by the bag so that we know that it's completely finished. So we are going to do our, um, again, um, so let's just talk a little bit. This is a 128 plug tray. That means there's 128 holes here. I have filled it with the block, with the um, seed starting mixture that Bobo made for sunflower starting. And because I am putting multiple different colors, which we're going to talk about next, um, and in here, I'm going to mark them. We like using painter's tape or masking tape. They both work great. Um, and then we use our garden marker. You can find this over on our website. And y'all, if you're using a Sharpie, you are in for a rude awakening in about a couple of weeks after that writing sits outside. It just vanishes. Um, this is a made to withstand UV rays and moisture. Um, and you can write on tape. You can write on wood. Um, so it works really, really well. So I am going to um, label the colors here in the tray, just like the tray I just showed you, um, because it becomes really important when, especially when you're harvesting as a flower farmer, most often you're cutting them when the, the blooms are really tight and they just, if my fingers were the petals, just as that first one starts to lift is when you cut them, you can't always tell which variety it is. So it really, really helps. So before I label these, let's just talk very briefly about the different colors. You would totally, um, I am totally thinking about when these flowers are going to bloom in my selection of colors. Um, and so I just want to also add just a little note that I will go back at the end of this broadcast and do my best to answer your questions. And I just see that Cynthia poses, I'm not usually on a live, where am I supposed to put a question? You can actually put the question exactly where you just posted that question, Cynthia. Um, and so this is new to me too. So we will figure it out um, along the way. And I appreciate y'all kind of going down this road with me. So I have here um, the colors that I think are best for spring blooming. So first I have the gold light, then I have the pro cut white light and the gold light is also a pro cut. Then we also have the new pro cut, which is peach. We'll put that over here. Um, we have sun filled green, which is not actually a pro cut, but it grows on that same timeline of 55 to 60 days from seed to bloom. And then we have the lemon. So I am just going to talk about them as I'm writing on my tape that I'm going to actually put on my side of the tray. Um, I'll just talk very briefly about these guys. So I am, because I know that, I know that they're first off all pro cuts with the exception of Sunfill. I'm not writing pro cut. I'm just writing the color and the date. And today is the 12th. And this is going to be peach. Peach is pretty much sold out everywhere. We do still have some in stock on our store. Um, but we, at this point in time, cannot get any more bulk. So get them while you can, friends. And we are super excited um, to see how they align with the other. This is going to be sun filled green. 
Okay, I'm going to write sun fill there. Um, so this is, you know, I always find that doing this step first, because after you get into the whole sowing business of starting the seeds, you'll forget to do this. So this is really the best thing to do. So the sun fill peach has a peach kind of halo glow. The sun fill green that I just wrote, um, actually we grow that not for the open bloom, but for um, the head with all the sepals. Those are the green layers of green foliage. We grow that as a filler, y'all. It actually will beef up your bouquets early in the season. And it's I use the green. I start the green because it's got the lighter colored green foliage. And it is an amazing addition. It actually looks like a succulent almost. Um, and you can find all of the colors over at thegardenersworkshop.com and compare them. Um, if you go to the Pro Cut Mix page, seed page. It shows all 12 of them there together. The sun fill is separate, of course, but you can kind of compare and see them all side by side. And that is super helpful. I just wrote that on the wrong side, y'all. That's lemon 312. And, you know, we'll, we're going to do this together. And I want to say, first off, you know, if I wasn't talking to you guys, this would be a super quick little job that a flower farmer needs to figure out how to do this every single week of their season. Um, this is white and I do need to write white light, white light. So the lemon that I just did, sorry, y'all, I'm not talking about a memo. The lemon pro cut has that really pale soft. It's almost like that baby yellow. Um, and that is a super helpful spring flower with a brown disc. Now I'm doing white light, white light um, is the white petal. Actually, I just posted a beautiful picture of a white light on my Facebook page this morning um, for anybody that wants to start y'all mind. I think this cocoa core is getting my snaz. Um, the white light has the gold chartreuse disc in the center. So that is like a no brainer, right? For spring. And then the last one, which if you all hang out with me for very long, you'll soon learn that I'm so fickled over flowers. But gold, the Pro Cut Gold Light is truly one of my most favorites for several reasons. Um, it is got gold petals with a chartreuse green center. And when you grow it like we grow it throughout the season, keeping it small, the blooms small, so they're super useful for um, bouquet making and for commercial customers, they literally almost look like Gerber daisies. Um, and our customers cannot get enough of them. So, and of course, with that color combo, they are a definite winner um, for spring. Y'all, sorry. I just have, my nose is not running, thankfully, but it is just itching like crazy. So there's something here that's lit me off because I have not had any food or drink in the last three hours. All right. So let's just move these out of the way here. Um, so because first off, you have to, I'll just very briefly, you know, we, this is our first year of not growing major production. After being a high production cut flower farmer for the past two decades, um, last year was our farewell, farewell season of growing for production. We grow now for exactly what I'm doing right now, education, experimenting, and helping other flower farmers um, to do what they need to do and to get started. Um, and so I'm not growing volume. If I was perhaps where I was last year or before, I would probably do an entire tray of each color. And that may sound like a lot to you, but in our normal sunflower rotations, um, sorry, the chair's kind of messed up here. Um, in our normal sunflower rotations, we plant 1,200 sunflowers a week for 26 weeks during the normal season. So starting a tray of each color as an experiment at this point in time um, is really a good thing. Is would not be unusual, but we're going to just do um, three rows of each. And then, of course, this is my favorite down here. I'm going to do four of the gold light. All right. 
So I think you can see me. So I literally use my hand. I hope I have enough seeds. I didn't even check that before I started. Um, so I'm just literally dropping a seed on the top of each cell. And we'll go back at the end and push all these in. Um, so I'm dropping one on the top of each. I'll push them in. And so sunflowers, you must know, um, I do have plenty of seeds, actually. Um, sunflowers sprout best in darkness, meaning that the seed should be covered with soil. That helps it to shed its shell as well as it sprouts and germinates. And what's next? Sunfill. So funny, y'all. I, I can mix things up so very, very quickly. All right. Um, so... After I get the seeds planted, I'm going to take this tray and put it on the floor in my grow room. I'm going to water in really, really well. And that why I say that is some people don't understand. It typically takes perhaps two or three passes over a tray with a sprinkler head, whatever it is you're using, water and canned or a hose, to really thoroughly wet a cell. You need to really check that out. Um, check a cell for you to kind of, if you do that once, it'll help you understand why you need to spend more time actually watering um, cell trays. So let's see what's next here. Lemon. Um, I'm going to water it in really well. And then because we are starting these sunflowers when it's not really warm outside, I mean, we're going down below in below 20s tonight. Um, it's not naturally hot and warm here in this building with a lot of sunshine. Um, so this tray is going to be popped onto a seedling heat mat. Um, you can also find those over at thegardenersworkshop.com if you need to read more about um, how those work. Y'all, it'd be so easy for me to keep talking and just keep on sowing instead of stopping and changing seeds. Sorry, it's, it's distracting me. Um, so, and they will sit on that heat mat getting watered every single morning. What's next? White light. Um, getting watered every single morning thoroughly. And then once about 50% of them actually sprout, um, we will, I'll pop them off of the heat over underneath a grow light. And here's what you need to know about that. The process that I am explaining to you now is the only the process I use in this pre- normal season startup. Um, once the season gets started um, and we are kind of like back into our full-fledged seed starting mode, because we still aren't starting warm season seeds here, y'all. We're going to start that next week, you know, all of our celosias and all those types of things. So I have room, not only on a heat mat, but I have room under my grow lights. So because under the normal grow season, what I would do with this, with these trays, is they would be taken outdoors and after they sprouted and just sat out on the porch in full blast and sun and because it's warm outside and that's where they would grow on until they're ready to be planted out in the garden. Not the case now. It is cold. Um, so these are not going outside. So after they sprout on the seedling heat mat, once 50% or more show cracking, you know, that little neck is considered cracking, um, they will be moved from the heat mat over to a grow light because let me tell you how quick they will start stretching and looking for light. And that's how you get tall, lanky um, sunflowers. All right. So now I am just going to take my fingers and I am just pushing those seeds about halfway down into the cell. Now, at this stage, if you looked down into the cell, you'd say, oh, shoot, I can still see the seed. Um, you don't need to put any extra soil on top. When you water this tray, it's going to wash the soil from the walls of the cell down on top of that seed and you will be good to go. Um, so I had all kinds of messages this week about there's a lot of people trying sunflowers that have never done it before, um, not just early burden, but doing it. And one, some of the things you just want to be sure of, you want to be sure you have good 
quality, viable seeds to start with. Um, I'm just going to tell you all a rabbit hole story from way back when. The reason that my business started packaging seeds, we do not save seeds. Um, we package the same seeds that we buy directly from either the hybridizer or seed houses and package them with my instructions is I went to do a project years ago um, when I was a flower farmer, but it was a gardening project. So it was a variety I didn't need to buy bulk of. And I bought some sunflowers from the local store, a wonderful brand name. And I came home. It was actually those um Russian mammoth sunflowers. Um, and I was making a sunflower playhouse. Anyway, I brought home this package of 25 or 50 seeds, whatever it was. And I came home and not one germinated. So I thought, huh, I start a lot of sunflowers. This is pretty unusual. So I went back and bought from a different source, another local source of more of that. And guess what? Believe it or not, both of them did not germinate. And that brought, and then when we started researching, what we found out is that if you're not buying seeds from businesses that are of the, the mindset that seeds are viable, they're alive organisms. And if they sit in a, let's just say, for instance, in a warehouse on the top of a stack of five pallets, and it's 170 degrees at the top of that warehouse because they're typically not air conditioned, that kills them. If they get too much moisture, I mean, there's a lot of things that can kill the vitality of seeds. So friends, I'm just saying to you, be sure you're starting with seeds that are alive. All right. So now I'm going to talk to you about what's going to happen next with this. So I'm going to take this tray and um, I'm going to put it on the floor in the grow room and I'm going to water it in. I'm going to then pop it up onto a seedling heat mat and it's going to stay there. I will guess three to five days. I'm going to water them every morning thoroughly. Again, check after you've watered what you think watering is. Dig out one of the cells and see if it's really wet all the way through. Um, I'm going to water them every day until 50% or more of these guys. Um, this has got to be the cocoa core, y'all. It's like my itching is getting worse, not better. <sighs> sorry. So very, very sorry. Um, water them thoroughly. Once 50% or more sprout, move them over to a grow light or move them outside, outside in full blown, full sun if it is 65 degrees or higher outside. If it's colder than that, they are not going to grow, y'all. They are not going to grow. In my grow room, um, if it gets, if you don't have heat source, you've got to get that temperature up if you want vegetative so, um, growth to happen. So then the early bird, the rest of this story is, I am so sorry, y'all. I'm about to rip my nose off. Um, the rest of the early bird is that these will grow in this tray normally two to three weeks before we plant them out. Because when that was going to happen, it is still a couple of weeks before my last frost date. My target this year was to plant sunflowers outside in my garden three weeks before my last frost date of April 15th. And when they're planted, they're immediately hooped and row cover with Ag-19, which is the lightest weight um, it's called lightweight row cover. You can find that on our website as well as that, the hoops and the weight bags. And that's where they're going to live. The blocking of the wind and that lightweight cover allowing 85% of air and light um, and water to penetrate. It means you don't have to take it off during the day. So that's how they're going to grow. And then fingers crossed, we're going to get sunflowers super early. Now, some things that can actually slow down the growth of sunflowers, temperature. If you don't provide heat or if you plant them out in the garden and it gets cold or cool and you don't have a way to protect them, they're just going to sit there like little popsicles. Um, it may not kill them because as I mentioned earlier, sunflowers are a little cooler than we think. Um, so, um, they're going to be a little bit, so that's going to slow their growth down. The blooms are naturally on pro cuts. So we typically grow pro cuts for several reasons as commercial growers. One, there's such a great selection of colors um, and they have stiffer necks. Most of them do. Some of the specialty colors, not so much, but we deal with it. 
um, is that they go from seed to bloom 55 to 60 days. That'll be slower. But also, even though these guys are day length neutral, and what that means is that even though the days are shorter right now, they're still going to grow into a vegetative plant and produce a bloom. However, you will find that the blooms tend to be smaller at this time of the year. So those are things to just be aware of. But let me tell you something, y'all. A, a sunflower this big is a flower that your customers will flip over. They don't even know what it is. Commercial customers love them. Um, they think they're Gerber daisies or some kind of daisy. So that's the story on those. Um, and I'm going to move this out of the way and then we're gonna do a few cuttings here. So let's talk about um, salvia cuttings. So let me point you guys back down to what we're doing here. All right. So y'all, I'm just going to step up here and wash my hands off. I think that I have that cocoa on my hands and that's what's making me kind of, y'all are going to watch me fall into an, uh, an allergic reaction here. So this is a good enough reason for us to not use this particular mix. All right. Now, if you haven't, if you don't know what salvia lacanthia and salvia mexicana look like, um, then I would invite you to check out either my Instagram feed or my um, Facebook feed. I just posted a video yesterday, I think, um, showing them in my garden. They're really, really beautiful. Um, they typically, you don't start them from seed. You have to start them from cuttings. It is super easy. And I'm going to talk you through the process here. Um, so just a little bit about them. They're great cut flower. Um, they grow to like almost five or six feet tall here on my farm. And if you get them in the ground early enough, um, and if you have to let them harden off a little bit before you start cutting them, people want to cut too early, me included, but you'll find that the tips wilt. So you just have to give them more time. But the other part of this flower is they are a huge bumblebee, um, really attractor. And, you know, bumblebees are native bees, and this is just a great late summer um, opportunity for them. And they're absolutely gorgeous, y'all. Um, I mean, they are so very, very beautiful. All right. So what we need to do this is um, you have to have mother plants. So a mother plant is just a plant that we have growing in large containers. Maybe I'll let you, I'll look at you for a minute. Um, the mother plants are in like, if you can, if you've ever seen the whiskey barrel size containers, we're talking a big container like that because my mother plants live in these containers year round. That's your insurance policy that you never go without salvia mother plants. Because as you will soon learn on here, um, that sometimes they're hard, the plants are hard to find. So when you get a plant, you want to preserve it. So we have actually, I think, five pots of mother plants, which is really more than I need. Um, and so we plant them in these big pots. They live out on my patio when the first frost um, first, really hard frost. So salvia lacanthia and salvia mexicana are winter hardy to zone eight. I'm at, I am zone 8A, 7B. I'm in southeastern Virginia. So I'm right on the edge, which that means is if we have a really crazy winter where, I mean, this is classic, just like we are now. We were 60 degrees last week, y'all. We're going down to 20 tonight. Um, and that's the kind of behavior that takes plants out. Um, so you don't want to put your plants out in the garden, all of your plants out there and have that happen. And then you have nothing to do what we're going to do with today, like we're going to do today. So the mother plant is just nothing but a pot that your plant lives in that never gets planted out in the garden. It lives out on my patty out here on the porch, looking beautiful all summer long. And one or two plants can produce hundreds of plants. So you don't really need um, to buy like a bunch. So where can you get them? Um, so I thought I would share this out of the gate because I did. So 
and I have no affiliates with any of um, with this company. I bought my mother plants about four years ago because I made the mistake of planting them all and not having a mother plant. And then a really cold, hard frost came and killed them all. I didn't have any plants. So I ordered from, it's called um, High Country Gardens. It's an online plant supplier. Unfortunately, though, I went there yesterday because somebody was asking and they are, it says out of stock on the Mexicana. The Mexicana is the one that is really hard to find. That's the one that has a green bloom, but it's actually the buds that are green. That is so fabulous in arrangements. Um, and that's the one that's hard to find. So search online. You, I bought, when I bought them from High Country, I just bought three of each plant and potted all three of them in one large container because you're going to cut the heck out of them this time of the year and the first month of their outside life because you'll be taking cuttings. Um, I will also say a flower farming, if you go to farmer's markets or something like that, where you, sorry, y'all. Um, if you sell somewhere where you're direct to retail, um, Dave Dowling shared with me that they used to, I mean, he had somebody that did this all the time to their salvia plants because they were constantly plant putting three plants in like a dish garden and selling them at the farmer's market for like 20 bucks. y'all. I mean, what a deal, right? For you and for your customers, because they're hard to find people cannot find them. Um, so to get your mother plants, scour the internet, you know, search, but you only need to buy, I bought, I think three was like a little price break, one for $6.99 or three for $12.99 or something. Um, you don't need a bunch of them. Plant those in your containers and make them your mother plants. Um, I always get questions about, do will this work on other plants? I am sure it will, but I'm not familiar. I only did this because I needed to ramp up my cut flower population in my garden. So I don't, I'm not a plant pro propagator. I'm just did this because this is how I needed to get more. So find some plants. Other places you will likely find plants. Oftentimes at Master Gardener plant sales, because of the way they can be propagated and it's so successful, you will find them at, um, they are not native plants, obviously Salvia Mexicana, right? But Master Gardeners have plant sales. Um, you'll oftentimes find them there and put your feelers out. Yell to the gardeners in, you know, on social media that are in your area and say, I'm looking to buy and pay whatever they want. Five or ten dollars from one plant that's healthy is a deal, y'all. Just get a plant and then go to making it your mother plant and then you'll be able to do what I'm talking about. So when um, so my plants are typically they live right outside of that door over there. Um, out on an open carport or carport with an open area at the end. That's where they live. And when it starts, our last frost date or first frost date is like mid-November. Oftentimes it's still not bad after that. When it starts dropping below 25 degrees at night is when we bring them in. We don't want to kill them back. We cut them down to about that tall um, and just drag the buckets literally in here in my workshop. They're not in a greenhouse. They're not getting any special TLC. They don't even get water, y'all. <laughs> That's why you want big containers. They literally just sit here. I mean, if I could show you what they look like, they are just barely surviving. But because we heat in here, they've actually sprouted. And that's what all of these cuttings come from. Um, so they literally, you can drag them into your garage um, and just set them in the corner. I mean, if you want to water them, you probably could, but you don't really have to um, if they're truly dormant. But once they start growing, they benefit from that. We find that using, um, this is called rooting powder, and this is the Fertilome brand. You'll find this on our website. It's like seven bucks for this jar. It will last you for the rest of your career, I promise you. I had the same one um, that we just ran out of two years ago, um, and we added it to our lineup because I needed one, and people kept asking, so we now have, I think it's like six or seven bucks or something. So what I do is, and I spilled, and I did it again. I didn't spill it as bad. I just dump a little bit into the tray lid. And so let's put that aside. I'm getting ahead of myself. So this is what the Salvia Lacanthia looks like. It's got the long skinny leaf. The Salvia Mexicana has more of a kind of a chubby leaf. And um, so I have just cut 
and I cut the stems just like I'm cutting a cut flower. I just go to the base of the stem and cut it. And then you can get most often two or three of these, at least at this time in life, um, of these out of one stem. And I will tell you that um, fresh new growth, like I'll show you this one. See how this was the top of a stem and this is the next sprout. Um, this fleshy new stuff typically just dies off and you really do not need two leaves on here. One does the job. And what you will soon learn is that this little bottom of this little cutting has to support everything up above. So there's no reason to keep a bunch of vegetation up there and especially with the Mexicana, that the vegetation is bigger. I don't always pull it off. It all depends on what kind of time I have, y'all, um, that I'll just take it down to one. So what happens is this, we use the same mix in this tray as I do um, for our sunflowers. So it's the very, so I have another itchy nose tray coming along here, y'all. All right, so I just mixed up my darn cuttings. See, I told y'all, I'm just so focused on running my, you know, jabber jaws. All right. So we've already made one of these trays. And so I'm starting a brand new one. And I'm going to turn you down here so you can see what I'm doing. And I can itch my nose. All right. And the other part of this equation is you need to have a cup of water. So um, I also like to take a pin and just punch a hole. That way, when you push your cutting into the mix with the rooting hormone on it, it doesn't push it off. Y'all, this is so easy. You're just not even going to understand why you didn't do this a long time ago. So I'm just dipping that and then literally just dipping. There you go. And I'll start back here. Um, and I just squeeze it in. Y'all, it is not rocket science, but you want to know what it is? And I want to cut some of these shorter. Um, you know what it is? You have to get up and do it. It's kind of like flower farming. People, if, if I can do it, anybody can do it. But here's the bottom line. You got to get up and do it every day. And that's what it is about sunflowers. Um, if you are a grower and you are trying to build a business, um, you know, we'll talk more about this as the season goes on, but sunflowers can float a business along with everything else you're growing. But here's the key. You've got to start them every single week. And that's where people fall off. They skip a week or they think they don't have time. You know, during our high production years, you know, you do the math, 1,200 stems a week. We did that for about 10 years. Um 1,200 stems a week, wholesale cost average, $1.25, sell out every week. I'll let you do the math of that, but it bought me a $30,000 tractor and implements in one year because um, we do 26 weeks of 1,200 a week. It is not hard to find time to do that. In fact, that's what began my journey of um, hiring somebody to just do seed starting for me to take it off the table of those of us that were here harvesting and processing and making bouquets and all of that stuff because we were too tired. See, here's a great example. See, this one's got two, plus it's got a little growth. I'm just going to pinch that off and get rid of that. Um, so this is all I'm going to do of the Mexicana. The Mexicana, in fact, I've kind of ravaged it, so there wasn't much to cut here this morning. So there you go. There's that row, and I'm going to do the Lacanthia next at the other end. So what I typically do um, for my needs is I'll start at this end with Mexicana, go to the other end um, with Lacanthia, and they'll meet in the middle. All right. So here we go. Got a little cutting. I'm just dipping it in the water going to then dip it into, oh, I didn't do the pin. And see, all the pin is so important because you'll scrape all the hormone off and the hormone just speeds up rooting. And you know what, y'all? I mean, no, you don't have to. But if you're in business, 
you want everything to move as quickly as possible. Um, and so my goal this year with these is I am doing a, a hedge project. And I will tell you that this, these two guys together, Salvia Mexicana and Salvia Lacanthia, um, are absolutely breathtakingly gorgeous in a hedge. We plant it along the wooden fence that's like a four board, three board fence that runs along the road. And I put a row of these and they kind of spill over the, um, the wooden fence. You want to talk about keeping your neighbors really happy with you if you are an urban farmer like me, where doesn't, you don't have to do anything wrong for a neighbor to complain about you to the city to cause you a big old booger. Um, doing that kind of stuff, not to mention the number of people that now walk on our street just to see all the bumblebees on this stuff in late summer and the people driving by. Um, it's just really, really a great thing to do. So I'm doing that um, up at the Learning Center, which is the child care for my church, which is at the end of my street, where I have a cutting garden, but the deer just work the cutting garden over. And I'm thinking, I'm going to, deer don't eat this either, by the way, y'all. Um, I'm going to plop in a row of this for the children to see the bumblebee action, as well as um, to have a little bit of cut flowers. So that's all I've got cut here, friends. So what is the rest of this story, right? What's going to happen? First off, I'm putting back that powder. So that's what I mean. This tray, this little jar will last you for the rest of your gardening career or your farming career even. And um, so let me pop y'all back up here. There you go. All right. It's kind of hard for me to talk to y'all without seeing myself, I guess. Um, so what's going to happen to this tray? And I'll tell you, I haven't told y'all this before. This is a new tip today because I'm doing, normally I don't get to this task when we were doing um, full-fledged production. We never had room, we never had time. We never even got to this job typically until late April. After all the initial seeds have been started, that first succession um, and everything's kind of planted, then I'd say, all right, Bobo or whoever, go do the cuttings for the salvia. Well, we're doing it much earlier this year. So what I tried last week, I did more cutting to finish off a tray and I popped them up onto the heat mat, which I've never done before. They've just sat on the floor of our warm grow room. And I can't tell you how much faster they're growing y'all. So if you want to do this and you, I mean, you could easily do an entire tray from if you have one or two mother plants um, and pop them onto a heat mat and they'll root even quicker. So again, just like those sunflowers, it's really too cold for them to go outside. So if you're going to do this early, you have to have grow light space to pop them under, or they're going to start stretching and elongating and just not growing a very happy life, y'all. I mean, that's kind of like, yes, you and I can survive on bread and water, but how good do we look after doing that for three weeks? Not very good, probably. That's how growing plants indoors without grow lights is. Yeah, they survive, but not only are they horrible looking, but then that leads them to a disease and pest prone life. We do know that stressed plants are more susceptible to disease and pests. So that's just the story. So I will grow these guys under grow lights in the grow room until it's warm enough, at least for the days, for me to pop them outside. I think all plants need to be outside y'all. That's part of natural growing. Um, you know, we only want to support them indoors for the shortest amount of time. That's another reason that I totally adore soil blocking um, is the plants grow a third quicker, third of the time you shave off a third of the indoor growing time. So I will pop these guys outside onto the porch once the temperatures are conducive, 65 degrees or higher, um, and get them well rooted in. And then once they've got a great little root system, you know, they get a little root bound, you know, but that's what you got to do. 
Um, you could root salvia in the two inch soil blocks, but we just do so many that's not very feasible. Um, and, you know, I try to do the right method that makes sense. Right. Um, and then I'm going to plant them out in my garden. So what's the spacing in a cutting garden bed? Um, I would put two rows in a 30 inch wide bed, six inches apart in the row. And I typically, when I was growing them for big production, I would put the head of the front half of the bed in salvia lacanthia and the back half of the bed in salvia mexicana. Not only does that make for killer photography, um, but it's just easy harvesting. And um, I will also give you a warning. The bumblebees are so heavy on these that you will not be cutting these late morning and early afternoon. You've got to go there first thing in the morning while the bumblebees are still asleep. You need to have be warned that they will sting you if you grab a bloom to pull it away to reach down to cut. Um, as someone that's allergic to bees, um, you just have to be cautious. And bees do sting through gloves. Um, so those are things that we'll probably come across later in the season. But in a landscaping situation, beautifulness, if I was planting a hedgerow, like I was speaking of for my neighbors to enjoy, it's about, I think it's like 60 or 70 feet long. Um, I would plant two rows again, because a double row just gives the biggest bang, y'all. Um, I would probably plant them 12 inches apart because you're not going to be cutting them constantly. And then staggering that 12. So if you have two rows, 12 inches apart, it's 12 inches here and 12 and a, a plant in this row and a plant in this row. And then do your 12 inches from that. And then if you stand up and look at the plants, they're got in a zigzag. Um, that gives an amazing um, just transplant. Um, I mean, not a transplant. Sorry, y'all. It just what happens if I look over at the questions, then I get totally distracted. That gives an amazing bang for your buck. So both of these will get your garden going really, really early. So I'm going to see how I can answer these questions now, y'all. So I'm Friends, if you are still there, I'm not sure if I am still here, but all of a sudden my internet just went, Arr! so sorry about that. Um, so if you're wondering about what all these sunflower emojis are all about, um, those are students of ours for the Gardener's Workshop. You know, we publish online courses, mine that I've created, as well as other flower farming professionals. Um, and so those are our students. And we just love seeing those on here. So I'm just looking through to see um, where there is a question. Question from Maria. Can you start seeds now in zone six Michigan inside and put in an unheated greenhouse? So Marie, that is a really wide question. Um, so first off, it totally depends on whether you're talking about cool season or warm season. Um, what we started today are warm season plants. So no, it is way too early for you to do that. However, I don't know if you're not familiar with my book, Cool Flowers, which is about cool season hardy annual plants. Um, and those are the plants that you would be starting way in advance of your last frost date and that you could plant outside um, into a hoop house. So I would encourage you to check that out. And there are tons of resources um, to support the book over on my website, thegardenersworkshop.com. There's a couple of free webinars. There's um, the Cool Season Flower Chronicles, which are more videos. So go to the Gardener's Workshop, go to my resources, um, and then go to Cool Flowers under the resources. And there's a lot of great information that will help you there. 
Um, and I see that Jesse must be on here posting some links. Good morning from Chile, Seattle. I'm new to seed starting. I'm learning soil blocking. Are you planning to have a live event on this topic soon? Um, so Lisa Tucker, isn't that funny? My name is Lisa and I have a golden retriever named Tucker. Um, so next Saturday on seed starting Saturday, I will be demonstrating because I will be starting some of our warm season seeds and I'll be doing that right here. But you can also find lots of resources over at the gardenersworkshop.com under um, the resources. There's a whole video guide. There's a seed starting made easy um, online course that's like $25. It's 90 minutes. There is an all things soil blocking area. Um, so go over there and just kind of fall in to our resources. I'm trying the white knight this spring. Hope I'm not making the wrong choice. Oh no, Aaron. Um, so the white knight pro cut just means white petals with a brown center. And I definitely think that is another good choice for spring. I think you're fine. So Emily says, I'm just re-watching your class and your favorite warm weather flowers. You know, one of the benefits of our online courses for those people not familiar is that once you buy it, you own it forever. You can go back in and watch it as many times as you want. And the biggest benefit that I think is underused is revisiting the courses, going back and revisiting, because guess what? You know, let's just say like um, somebody just mentioned that they're just starting out with soil blocking. Do you have any idea when you're just starting in any area, soil blocking, flower farming, a specific area of flowers, or like in Dave's class, growing bulbs? When you're just getting started, you have so much basic information that you need and you're absorbing all that from the course. But what you don't notice is all the information beyond that. And then when your business or your gardening abilities advance some and you go back and rewatch, it's like, oh, my gosh, I didn't even notice that next time. Now I'm going to do that. It's like you're eating that big pizza one little baby bite at a time. Um, and so I just always want to mention that to people. Rewatching any course you've bought from us, I think there's more value in the rewatching than there is in the first time watching. Um, and so that is really awesome. Thanks for mentioning that, Emily. So I'm just reading. Please remind me how tall sunflowers need to be before I plant them out. So Susan is asking how big the sunflowers should be. So it's these are too little. And I will tell you, um, it's the two to three week mark. And it's not the size as much as, and I'm going to sacrifice the sunflower right now, y'all. It's when I go to pull. Oh, when I go to pull on a stem. And the whole guy, look at that. And the whole plug comes out without me thinking I'm going to rip the stem out of the soil, which I almost thought I was going to do there. Um, that's when it's they're, they're ready to go out in the garden because, first off, you know, people that work for me actually do the planting now. And if they had to spend an extra 35 seconds on every plug, digging it out with a um, plant marker or a popsicle stick kind of thing. That is a total waste of time. But if they can just pull it and it comes right out, quick and efficient. That is the moral to my story. So they're li literally probably close to four to six inches tall, but it's that pull and you want to plant them as early as you can for them to acclimate the best. And sunflowers do really, really well. Melanie, the heat mat makes a world of difference. I bought the small one from you a couple of years ago. And you know what? It's so funny that a seedling heat mat is one of the, the tools of the trade that people resist buying the most. And then when they take the plunge and learn how it speeds up seed starting, more seeds start, they start more uniformly. Um, and it just makes it just gets you off to a whole new start. So thank you, Melanie, for um, mentioning that. And we also have the small home gardener version as well as the bigger one. Barb, my salvia lacanthia did not have the little white tip last year. Did I have a different kind? And yes, Barb, I want that kind. So great point. So there's a couple of different um, varieties of salvia lacanthia. 
Um, and typically the one that is most widely available has is purple. They look like purple velvet, y'all. But they have a little white dot at the tip of each little individual flower along the stem. There's a solid purple, which I personally prefer and love, but I can never get it. I'm not sure if we have a mother plant of that. We might have fixed that last year, but you never know which one you're getting especially when you're buying at plant sales. So there are two different kinds. Yay for the bumblebees. Can't wait to see them again. So somebody's asking, would you consider selling cuttings to your local people? We really don't have a local outlet at this point in time. And I mean, I know that sounds pretty simple, but um, if we ever have a... Um, open farm again, which I can almost 100% tell you guys is not happening this year. My home is having an addition put on, which is just about to start. So it's going to be like a bomb went off here all season. Um, but we, I never say never anymore. I have Salvia Mexicana for sale for anyone interested in Houston. There you go. So you guys connecting and helping each other. Um, I mean, first off, you want to give the greatest Mother's Day gifts get this stuff rooted and going. Um, there's just so many opportunities. Um, I live in the Caribbean. What is the name of the cut flowers you grow in heat? Um, so, and warm season tender annuals, my book, Vegetables Love Flowers, which you can get off of the big old bookseller that sells everywhere, um, is about both how to have a three season garden and it kind of outlines the seasons and you would probably really benefit from that. Um, I meant to say my lacanthia was solid purple, but not white tips. I have two tone. I love the two tones. Yeah. So there are different varieties. Tanya says propagation is an obsession of mine. I've done a hundred thousand in my nursery career. I've got over 300 now. So much fun. It's a little addictive. Seed starting addiction is what led me to become a flower farmer. y'all. Everybody. So Robin says everyone loves sunflowers. Let me tell you something, friends. People, and I want to say also, my seed starting Saturdays, you're going to soon notice it's kind of a repetitive practice because guess what? That's what my business is. People think that there's all this different, all these different components and new and especially exciting things. It's really just doing the same things over and over because guess what I figured out? It took me only about five to seven years to figure this out from the beginning. People love a few basic flowers. They like other flowers, but they love a few basics. And we're coming up with an idea, I mean, a, a program on that. Um, there are so few, and that's why I attribute so many people that start farming, but never make it out of the success gate because they definitely have too big of a view. You need to zoom it down. And sunflowers are definitely in that family. Um, and Sunflowers, of course, are really big right now. They're just such a great sign of unity, love, hope, um, and coming together. And yeah, I'm dreaming of sunflowers and 65 degrees. Barb, was that six inch apart in salvia for salvia in a 30 inch bed? For cut flower growing, 30 inch bed, two rows kind of centered in that 30 inch bed, six inches apart in the row, 12 inches apart. Um, in a landscape situation. What is the soil mixture you're using besides cocoa? My normal seed starting in plug tray for sunflowers and salvia cuttings is 50% of any kind of potting mix that you buy, get stuff without chemicals in it, and 50% finished compost. This is a mix of also cocoa fiber, which we're not going to use. I've actually had lots of conversations about cocoa fiber, um, and it definitely dries out much quicker than peat moss does. And that's a problem in some things. Um, all right, y'all. So I see that I'm still here. Um, so thank you so much. I don't know why my internet um, kind of left. Anyway. I'm just looking for questions. Cynthia, I have the same question for a lot of my cool flowers. Is there a source that suggests how old or tall they should be before we plant out, no matter what you're growing? Yes, Cynthia. So my general rule is I don't talk 
um, length of growing time because everybody's growing conditions are different, right? So I say my goal is to have a three to five inch plant to go out to the garden. Three to five inch is typically anywhere from three to six weeks for soil blocking anyway, um, for most plants. Even those plants like right behind me, I'll show y'all one. This is, this is one of my, um, I have a cool flower experiment going on. Um, anyway, I posted about that today on Instagram. You can read more about it. This is status. And you can see that it doesn't do it quite as much as Rebecca does, but they kind of grow flat. They grow up and then out um, instead of growing really tall with the central stem. And um, so these are borderline. Um, there, these ones in the middle are almost that one leaf is what I'm looking to be three to five inches tall, if that helps you. And that is what I look through. Um, I mean, this is scabiosis. And these are just about, these could go out to the garden, but because they're so healthy and nobody else is ready, they're going to wait another week, right? And then you can look, and here's even smaller guys. This is Lombata, Monarda. If you are not growing that, you've got to grow it. It's not like any other Monarda, y'all. Um, you'll find the seed over at the gardener's workshop and is a cut flower. We, we cut it before, while it's still green. Um, not real green, greeny silver. It is, a, it is the most luscious gorgeous addition to wedding work um, and just for bouquets. So these guys are obviously too small. It's a central stem grower. So they're going to be about this tall before I would plant them out. So the three to five inches um, is either how tall the central stem is or how tall, like on Rebecca's straw flowers or status, how long those um, leaves are. You're looking for a three to five inch. All right, Cherry, Southern Ohio, Zone 6. I started a Costa Snapdragon before realizing that just because they bloom in late winter for Zone 10, I'm thinking they'll, they'd like my cold temperatures. What are my chances? Well, first off, Snapdragons are super winter hardy. Um, for anybody that is not familiar with my book, Cool Flowers, you got to check it out and all the free resources we support it with over on my website. It is. The book is written for home gardening, but it's easily applied to farming. But a lot of my resources also do that. It helps you to wrap your head around how we plant cool season hardy annuals at the wrong time, most of us. And it's tricky. Snapdragons are super winter hardy. They're actually winter hardy up to zone five. At least the rocket variety is. And then some of the others aren't quite that, but they're still winter hardy. Um, so the different numbers... Um, of when they actually bloom, the group that they're a member of dictates when they actually will bloom better. And that's all related to day length. So that Snapdragon will probably be fine. You'll just have to see when it actually is going to bloom for you. But they're all good and winter hardy. And you've got to check out Cool Flowers because it will rock your world. My first round of stock seedlings kind of blanched, whitened, and didn't grow much. I fertilized and getting small true leaves now, but never had that. What gives? I do not know. I'm not sure. I guess you're saying that they're still inside. Um, stock's an easy grower, um, typically. I mean, they're strong, um, strong germinators, um, and they grow pretty healthy. We tend to grow plant stock outdoors when it's three weeks old because it gets really ugly really fast because it is such a great grower um, and stock does not like heat so you got to get it outside going so you beat that heat um, so I just say start it again and see something in your environment did not make it happy Janet says I pay $20 for one plant but I'm very happy that's right because that one plant can make you hundreds um, and if you can find a plant, you're really, really happy. So hello, everybody. Um, Sandy, I'm going to start Blue Plurum. So I'm only going to be able to take a couple more questions here. I'm going to start Blue Plurum. I know you have instructions somewhere. I'm just not sure where they are. So Sandy, so I have a private Facebook group and the name of the group is The Flower Farmer Show. 
And that's the name of the group. You're going to have to answer three questions. And then I'm the one that approves and denies people into that group. That group is for flower farmers, flower farmers that are dreaming of being a flower farmer, becoming a flower farmer or are a flower farmer. So once you get into that group, if you look, it's pinned to the top and the features is where you'll find those instructions. The two different types of salvia. And I actually posted that in a description when I was signing up. I mean, coming on here. So that should be somewhere. It is salvia mexicana and salvia lucanthia. All right. So Virginia, I'm going to answer this question and this is going to end it for us, friends. And um, so I just invite you to join me Wednesdays. I do a couple of lives, one on Ask a Flower Farmer on Instagram, and I do a clubhouse chat. Um, and I also have a great field, um, field and garden podcast, which is also here on YouTube. Virginia asks, when you plant out your sunflowers, will you leave the row covers on or take off on a nice day? So for these early bird sunflowers that are being planted out up to three weeks before my last frost date, they are immediately being hooped and covered to protect them um, from the cold wind and to concentrate as much as the heat as I want, um, as we can, right? Um, and then I leave that cover on until it starts to warm up outside. So typically for these early birds, they literally are pushing the row cover off by their growth before I actually remove it. If a day warms up, I just leave it on because that just pushes them to grow even more than that. Um, so friends, that we're going to wrap it up with that. Thank you so much. Check out the Gardener's Workshop for some of those resources that I've mentioned throughout, and I would love to sign a book for you. So now let me figure out how to end this broadcast. <laughs> we're all doing new stuff, y'all. Thanks, friends.